So, being an Australian, we look at the world in a slightly different way. Um, <laughs> although this, this sculpture is actually in London. It's, it's outside uh, the London School of Economics where uh, my son was a recent student and I, I thought it was a beautiful sculpture. But it, it definitely looks at the world the way, the way we do. <laughs> so are we pursuing you know, um, the holy grail? You know, this is what we're trying to find. Something that, um, like Jim was saying, <coughs> why do we need a system? But we, there is a sense that we need some kind of solution, some sort of way forward. But can we reach it? Is it, is it elusive? Um, and uh, <clears throat> probably many of you know uh, the Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And uh, that's, maybe, that's maybe more like what we have been doing now, actually. <laughs> And I won't go through all these questions, um, but these are some of the questions that, we're, that we've been asking today and last week. Um, and the word utility is one that we, we like. You know, we can talk about validity and we can talk about, um, you know, um, I suppose more philosophical aspects of it, but um, what, what's useful? What is useful for uh, the service users, for the people experiencing mental ill health, which is a very big number of people? We saw data last week from um, the Dunedin study, um, Caspi presented, which showed that 84% of people will reach uh, uh, the threshold for having a need for care um, by, the, by the age of 45. So it's not one in, two, one in five, it's not one in two even. It's, it's nearly everybody has a period of mental ill health at some point. So it's, <clears throat> and we, and you, know, you might say, well, that's meaningless, it's just the human condition. But we don't say that about physical health. We, we, every single one of us has a need for physical health care at some point, whether it's a virus, whether it's um, you know, an injury. or So we expect to need physical health care. So we should expect to need mental health care of some kind. You know, mm -hmm. That's what this data is showing. So very, very important issue. But what is, what is going to be useful to people experiencing poor mental health? And what is going to be useful to us as, as clinicians or researchers? Um, we need something that works better. We, we, we all agree, I think, the current system doesn't work that well, but as Niall was pointing out, we can't just throw it overboard without having some alternative because we might end up in a worse place. And, and uh, I think that's a very, there's a risk. But then that risk makes people paralyzed. They can't, they can't move forward because they're afraid to, to actually do some new things. So, um, and this is, this is where I started in psychiatry. That's not me, by the way. That's, um, that's, that's a, a patient in an Irish mental hospital in the 19th century. But it's the kind of patient that gave rise to the Kreplinian idea of dementia precox and schizophrenia. And I was kind of shocked when I first got into psychiatry because um, that idea was so strong in the minds of, of, of the psychiatrists that they would communicate that hopelessness to the patient um, in the first, inter in the first uh, episode of care. And I think the theme in already has been coming through. You can't do that. You can't, you can't actually have a diagnostic approach that, that actually makes patients worse you know, by communicating things that the diagnosis uh, is it, not even justified to say that to patients. So, so we need a, a, we need a, a, a more um, uh, valid or, or, or um, genuine sort of a process. And I won't go through all that because it's been covered already, except to say that one of the critics um, of the current approach, and he makes some reasonable points, but I just want to clarify, all the accusations that Alan Francis made about DSM-5 were actually failures of DSM-4, which he was responsible for. So, so I think uh, you have to just take some of these statements with a grain of salt. Um, there are many attempts to, to come up with new approaches um, to try to uh, simplify or uh, ground the, the categories that we try to use or the dimensions we try to use in a better way. Um, because obviously things like DSM are based on consensus approaches and um, so high top, for example, is a way of looking at the, the natural structure of, uh, of um, symptom clusters and data and, and trying to see if, if you can actually simplify it in, in a useful way. But it also lacks clinical utility though. Clinical staging. I'm going to talk about network theory was mentioned, um, and complex systems. So, and the the other thing is, you know, classification diagnosis are nomothetic approaches. So we try to try to sort of um, simplify the world in, in uh, with 
whether they're dimensions or categories. The ideographic approach, um, which is focusing on the individual, and it comes probably more from psychotherapeutic traditions, that's much more individually focused. And it's not, it's not the same thing. It's a therapeutic thing, but it, it's not really about um, classification. And, and uh, so it's, they, and they're quite compatible, actually. They, they're always, they're always um, proposed as um, in competition in some way, but they're complementary, I think, that, I think you can say. So one of the great thinkers, I think, with clarity of thought in this space was Robert Kendall, who was a British psychiatrist um, <clears throat> writing in the 1970s and 80s. And, you know, it's really about classification rather than diagnosis, this, this, this statement. But he, he's, he pointed out that there are three sets of characteristics that we have. Characteristics that we share with everybody, or almost everybody. Characteristics that are unique to ourselves because of our unique lives. And characteristics that we share with some people but not others. And the only ones that are any use in terms of classifying or, or, or grouping people are the, uh, is, is the middle group, uh, so, sorry, the, um, the last group, uh, the ones that we share with some people but not others. And that's true, you know. So you can actually uh, group people in different ways and lots of different ways of doing that. But, but that's, a, th that's just one example of the clarity of thought that's in this book. It, you, it, uh, it may be out of print, but it's definitely worth reading if you're interested in this, um, in this area. And Jim and I, as, as Niall said, uh, tried to think about this issue um, with a bit of depth around the time of the DSM-5 because it was very, very controversial at that time. We, when we wrote this brief paper in The Lancet, um, trying to, try to sort of, um, it, it was called redeeming diagnosis. I don't know if we, if we did that, but we, we said that's something we should try to do. We should try to, to make it more uh, useful and more positively considered. So lots of attempts to sort of uh, create an ecosystem uh, as, um, in this area, the RDOC, high top. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that. It's, it's fairly American, but I think there are uh, collaborators from many other countries as well involved in this. Um, they're mostly quantitative psychologists who do various kinds of fancy factor analysis and, and uh, techniques like that to kind of work out what the structure of psychopathology actually is. Um, the problem they have is that the data sets they have access to are either general population samples in which most people um, don't have mental illness, um, or they're, they're samples of chronic mental, mental, mental illness uh, uh, cohorts. And that's not representative of the full universe of, of, of mental illness, especially the early stages of, 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 of mental ill health. So that's a bit of a problem. And they don't have a very dynamic or, or prospective longitudinal um, approach. They haven't built that in yet either. But it could be built in. It could be included. So, anyway, it's a, it's a it's a positive development. Very recent. It's only been going for a, maybe three or four years. And then this P factor idea, the idea that there's one general overarching, uh, you know, uh, factor in in psychopathology, which Caspi um, has basically and, and Moffat have been uh, <clears throat> supporting, and we saw some very good evidence for that the other day when he presented uh, the latest data from the Dunedin study. And we heard about network analysis. That's a method, really, ra rather, um, which might help us to understand what is happening in a more dynamic way, um, longitudinally or prospectively. Uh, it's not really a classification system. It's more a method of working out how um, symptoms and experiences uh, influence each other and how they stabilize or ebb and flow. So it's, it's very nice, it, but it, ne it requires high, very high quality um, and, and rich data to actually, uh, uh, to actually uh, study it. And then Doreen wouldn't forgive me if I didn't put this slide up. This is a, um, this is something that, um, it's a, it's a, it's a reframing actually of, of the, of the experience of mental ill health in, in using the philosophy of Joseph, Joseph Campbell, um, who popularized the monomyth, uh, which is basically pointing out that all of us have struggles in life. All of, all of us have, um, ordeals that we have to go through and, and there are ways that we can be supported to deal with these and there are ways that we can actually uh, flourish or the ways that we can actually fail and, 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 uh, and, and get into great crisis. So it's, um, it's, I don't know how well known this is, but it's kind of a very positive way of looking at 
the experience of mental illness. It doesn't rule out treatment or, or, um, or professional help or anything like that, but it's, um, it helps the patient to sort of feel that they're not alone and, and I think that they've got a, a, a sort of a connection with everybody else you know, in terms of dealing with these issues. And it fits in with the data that we all experience of periods of poor mental health at some time or another, or most of us do. So anyway, but I think what's become clearer in our thinking uh, is that we, we need a transdiagnostic approach. And I, I've had the experience of going to many research conferences over the years, starting off with schizophrenia meetings in particular. And the way, you know, research and, and uh, the field is actually divided up, it, it's divided up into these silos or, or, or compartments. And it's quite striking when you go to uh, these meetings and you hear all the you hear all the schizophrenia researchers talking, and then you you, you happen to go to a bipolar conference, and they, and they they obviously have not communicated with each other very well because the same issues are sort of discussed and there's not much reference to it across the the silos. So, um, and particularly with staging, I think. Um, we have to adopt a transdiagnostic approach, which, which doesn't assume that these these categories are exactly the, the ones we need to use. So, um, and so, uh, we've tried to develop this idea. It's been taken from somatic medicine, from from gen general medicine, um, and, and you probably recognise it, particularly in cancer, in the treatment of cancer, but also in other potentially uh, persistent or enduring illnesses. It, that, it, it would apply probably, you know, in a number of other areas as well, not just cancer. And it, it might be useful. It's still heuristic. We call it a heuristic idea. So it's not ready to be used probably in the real world. But and the, and the, the basic idea is that the treatment of, of, a, of a person, um, you can't just say someone has diagnosis X. You have to know what stage of the illness the person is at. An example would be with breast cancer. Um, the treatment of someone, of a woman presenting with a small breast lump which has not spread uh, and, and, and someone, uh, a woman who's presenting at a different stage with uh, metastatic cancer in the bones and in the lymph nodes and the treatments are, are, are completely different. And what are the hallmarks of treatment um, that are different? Well, the treatment in the early stage, let's say stage one, is simple and it's safe you know, and it's much more likely to be uh, successful. So, so um, uh, but it has to be safer. The treatment of, of the person with more advanced cancer is more radical um, and, and m more elements to it. So you might have radical surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and there would be a lot more side effects uh, and the chances of success would be much less. So we decided that, that that might be something you could apply in psychiatry because you want to prevent over-treatment. You want to prevent people getting um, too much treatment, especially premature use of medications and, and other things that might have risks. But you, you want to also guard against under-treatment, because if you under-treat somebody, if you under-treat the person, then the risk is that the progression will occur. And that, this is the problem with this idea of step care, which you probably heard of too. Step care waits for the person to get worse and then increases the, the intensity of the treatment. Staged care tries to prevent the risk of, of, of getting to the next stage. That's what you're trying to do in cancer treatment. You're trying to stop the person getting from stage two to stage three or, or, or stage one to stage two. So, so it's, it's, it's really an antidote um, to over-treatment as well. And, and it's very much linked to risk-benefit considerations, each stage. And this, so it is worth making a categorical decision um, uh, um, according to stages because uh, guided by the risk-benefit ratio. Um, now, it's an empirical question where you draw the line because as Jim and many other people have tried to make the point, these, these phenomena are dimensional phenomena, like hypertension and so on in, in medicine, but you make a cut point and, and it's based on empirical evidence, you know, um, and that can change. You know? So if the evidence changes, you, you, might, you might change whether the, the actual categorical decision is actually made. So anyway, we, we just published this book last year, which tries to capture some of the thinking and some of the evidence um, around this idea. What, where it came from really was, was, was in, within the psychosis area where we, back about 25 years ago, we defined um, prospectively a, a collection of symptoms and features that, that, that indicated an increased risk of, of developing a first episode of psychosis. And it wasn't schizophrenia, it was, it was transition to first episode psychosis, which included schizophrenia, but not only schizophrenia. And this was reasonably successful. It, um, it predicted originally about a 40% transition rate within a year or so. Now the transition rate is much lower, 
which might be partly due to sampling issues, but it also might be due to the fact that the psychosocial treatments that we offer now are more effective. You know, we, we definitely see benefit in these patients from, from delivering CBT-informed um, psychosocial treatments, and um, there's a lot of evidence about that now. Um, but what we also see is that there are, there are so-called false positives in these patients. Uh, so some of them make a transition. It's probably about maybe 20%, 30% even uh, now, but 65% or 70% don't, tra don't make the transition to first episode psychosis. Uh, another subgroup will have persistent subthreshold positive symptoms of psychosis. And another group will actually either um, continue with depression and anxiety and other non-psychotic syndromes, or they will develop new um, mood and, and other, other types of disorders or, or syndromes. So the, the basic point is when you follow up all these patients over many years, the vast majority of them will, of the, of them will have a need for care. Um, it won't always be psychosis, but they are a group of patients who, if, they, if they've been help-seeking, they will actually um, have a need for care. But the lesson from that is not to try to reinforce, you know, the, the rigidity of the, of the psychosis um, uh, phenotype there, but to actually look at how this is a transdiagnostic trans issue. Even when you're trying to zero in on the people at risk for psychosis, you find a, um, that, that there are other pathways as well. So it, it's a lesson that you have to have a much more transdiagnostic approach, and maybe you should define this stage one condition in a, in a, in a, more, in a wider sort of way, which we try to do. And we've, we've addressed some of these issues in world psychiatry last, last year or the year before uh, because the, the area's always been um, hi highly contested, I would say. There's a lot of debate, a lot of opinion and, and, and debate about this concept, which led to a lot of new research. And, uh, but I think um, we can learn quite a few things which take us forward rather than, rather, rather than getting stuck. And this is the way we started off thinking 25 years ago, that we were trying to sort of find the predictors, whether they were symptoms or biology or, or other, other variables, to predict who was going to be, who was going to develop psychosis and particularly, you know, um, non-effective psychosis, I suppose. But, but as Niall, Niall put up the slide before that, and this was in the paper that Jim and I wrote, where you see these microphenotypes you know, early on, which um, there's a need for care. The patients are distressed. They have functional impairment in these early stages. So they, 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 they seek help or people seek help for them. And when we see them, they don't fit into these you know, late, later phenotypes or macrophenotypes like schizophrenia or bipolar. They just don't fit into those. But you, you can't just send them away and say, I'm sorry, you know, um, we're not going to help you because you haven't ticked the box yet for schizophrenia. But you know, services often do that, but, but that's not very appropriate either. Um, and also, how do we, can we actually predict which pathway they're going to follow? Um, I'll skip that one. That's... So originally we, we thought in a very concrete way about it. We thought it was like catching a train and you were buying a ticket and you didn't really know where you were going. But, but we thought if we could actually clarify the phenotype that you might be able to you know, at least know which train you had you you had boarded and where you might be heading. But that was a, that was too concrete, and 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 I think that that follow up data for the ultra high risk group have shown that that they, there are different pathways, and we can't really predict, um, even though the person does need help and they are at risk. Um, and what we've seen is since the staging idea was 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 um, uh, written about and, and formulated. Some people working in the existing diagnostic silos, like in bipolar disorder or, or eating disorders, have tried to develop a staging framework for that particular category. So we have about five or six different staging, staging models where we think there should just be probably one, which, 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 at least at the beginning, which then uh, allows these, these later phenotypes to emerge. On the other hand, when you look at the data from the Dunedin study and you see comorbidity, you know, persisting and even increasing um, you know, as, as, as you progress down, down the track of, of, of um, persistent disorder, maybe, maybe it's not true that you actually end up getting a clearer picture over time. You might be able to force people into different, into different categories, but, but um, comor comorbidity or, or multiple syndromes is very common. And, and, um, and so this, that might be too simple as well. Why do you need diagnosis? Coming back to what um, Nala was talking about. Well, the only real reason is if, if it helps you with treatment selection. 
That's the idea of the staging idea. Uh, diagnosis is only really important to help the clinician decide what is the right sort of help to give and in what sort of sequence you give it. And, and staging might be a way of refining the diagnosis and refining the, the treatment selection process. It's also useful for, for prediction of prognosis because obviously an early stage um, it has a better prognosis than a late stage. But I think the real practical thing, if we go back to utility, is how does it help me work out what, what to offer this patient? And also, then you can also have some shared decision making with the patient coming back to the input of service users and, and consumers too. So specificity and timing are the two things now. This is Jim's paper from, I think, American Journal a few years ago. And it leads into a, an idea about how the symptoms act as risk factors for each other. Um, and, and that's kind of an attractive idea. When you see patients in very early stages of illness, which we do now in Australia, I'm gonna talk about this towards the end, we see large numbers of young people coming into these youth mental health platforms of care and they haven't, they, they're in the very earliest stage of, of, of distress and problems, you know. And, and you see this, this actually in real life. You see these things happening, the people not sleeping properly in adolescence. Um, they start to lose energy. They start to worry about things. They, they wake up at four o'clock in the morning. They can't sleep. They're worrying about everything. And then they start to get depressed. And so you can see how the, the, the sequence actually evolves. No one has really ever studied this before except retrospectively, you know, when you take a history from a patient, you hear about it in retrospect, but you don't know if that's the way it really happened. But when you, when you see it going forwards like this, um, it's, 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 quite, it's very different. I, I've learned so much in the last 10 years from actually seeing these illnesses actually emerge before your eyes, which we never saw before. We, all saw, we sat back in our clinics and they all came in and it was, la it was late. Yeah, and I mentioned microfit. So, the Global Mental Health Movement, the Lancet um, Commission on, on uh, Global Mental Health, uh, very kindly included this staging idea and elaborated it in, in, the, in the Lancet Commission in 2018. Um, and we've tried to write about this from a heuristic point of view over the last few years, Ian Hickey and Jan Scott and others, and, and uh, so there's quite a lot written about it. But the network idea, we found that very attractive and it, and it was obviously developed in the Netherlands and that's why we had this meeting in Amsterdam last week because that's where the, the, the kind of energy around this network analysis technique is, is based. We've, we've learned from, from our Dutch colleagues about how to do this. And, and uh, so we had some data from a, a study of about 800 young people uh, aged between 12 and 25. I think the mean age might have been about maybe 19. And we were able to use this network approach to look at how the psychopathology evolved over, over the first year of follow-up. And some of these patients progressed from an early stage of problem to a later stage. And we could see that the network relationships in the people who progressed and the ones who didn't progress were different. And that was predicted by the network theory, uh, that that would be the case. And we didn't really have enough data to really um, I don't, I don't think make some deep understanding of this, but it, we were able to at least explore the idea using this technique. Yeah, that's it. So you see how the, the strength of the relationships between the different symptoms um, changes. And, th and this is based on real data. So it's actually putting into real life what, what Jim's uh, slide from his American Journal paper was showing, that these symptoms actually change in their relationship to each other over time. Now, how that leads to the way you should think about the syndromes, we're still, it's still a work in progress, but you can, you can see how research technique can help us understand the structure of these things now much better. Thank you very much. So the bands show the strength of the relationship between the symptoms. So Barnaby Nelson, another colleague, um, has been working with um, our Dutch colleagues um, to, to actually um, make these models more dynamic, um, move away from more static sort of uh, ways of uh, looking at these relationships. And then this whole idea of complex systems, which I haven't got time to really explain, but, but it shows that um, over time the, these things can actually change and, and learning from other areas of, um, of scientific work like climate change and, and the stock markets, for example. You, you can use these kind of um, uh, t uh, analytic techniques from complex systems, which, and we are very complex. The way our minds work and the way the symptoms and experiences occur and evolve, it's, it's very um, complex and, and our techniques have very, been very simple. 
rating scales and um, you know, very concrete, linear sort of uh, ways of thinking. And some of our colleagues in other areas of, of other, other disciplines are actually teaching us. You know, uh, um, now, whether we can actually do it or not, I'm not sure, because it, uh, it's still early days. <coughs> Yeah, and then the whole idea of the neurobiology, how does it relate to these superficial experiences or syndromes that we were describing? And biomarkers, you know, one of the problems with the biological psychiatry has been that there's been huge emphasis on it um, over the last 30 years with not much progress really in terms of how, how it affects treatment. But maybe that's partly because it's been researched using the traditional categories of schizophrenia and bipolar and, and, and hasn't been looked at in, 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 from a different perspective. For example, the stage of illness would be, might be another way that biomarkers would make sense. For example, like I think Niall mentioned, um, inflammation. Inflammation might be a process that's relevant in, in some mental, mental disorders, but it's very unlikely to, to map precisely onto the DSM categories. So you have to study it across the, the spectrum and maybe the stage of illness would be a more interesting relationship to look at. That's, that's linked there too. So treatments, you can study treatments like that as well. So we've, we've done studies with uh, omega-3 fatty acids. We're, we're looking at cannabidiol and, and other, other treatments like that now, no, novel therapies. And obviously the psychosocial treatments are very transdiagnostic, but the biological treatments, the biotherapies that we're trying to look at um, might relate to mechanisms which are transdiagnostic. Yeah, that's, so that's the transdiagnostic. Um. Okay, so that's, that's kind of um, a very rapid overview of possible um, research strategies that might might be relevant to, to creating a, a new ecosystem of diagnosis, that, um, as we talked about last week. Um, and they would have to be utility-based. So, so in other words, um, they, they would have to be the judgment as, as to whether to go with them or not is, do they help? Are they helpful to us? Are they helpful to patients and service users? Are they helpful to us as clinicians or researchers? And I suppose the other thing to mention is that coming back to the, the quote at the end about um, the nurse or something worse, the, the, the value, of, I think, of a, of a health approach to this as, a, as opposed to a purely social approach is that it, we have to make the judgment of, 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 about access to the sick role, which is a sociological concept, the, the sick role, um, illness behavior and the sick role. Doctors and the health systems or, or health professionals uh, um, are the gatekeepers to that. You know, so so if, you, if you were able to get um, the, the, the care that you need supported by, by government or, or if, you're, if you need uh, social welfare or other support, you know, um, someone has to make a judgment about that. And, and if you take that away, if you take that sort of, um, uh, um, I don't know, respect for, the, for expertise away and it's just some kind of social problem, it's very unlikely that the money that is now, even spent now on mental health care would, would, would survive, um, in my opinion. And um, we, we don't have enough money. Every country in the world underfunds, underspends on mental health care. We spend about 7% of our health budget on, on mental health care. It's nearly 17% of the burden of disease. So we, un we underfund it already. But if you start to say it's just, you know, the human condition, and, you, and you, then you start to go down the track of blaming the person for the problem, and, and somehow they should just get stronger and be more resilient. And I, I think there's a risk in terms of the, the worse, uh, the nurse issue, uh, nurse and worse issue that we might, we could easily lose something in that process. So we have to keep both sides of those that those discussions going. Probably now I haven't got much time, so I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, this is relevant because it's more about the therapeutic uh, implications of of, of this uh, staging early intervention idea. So. A lot of the prototypes for this were developed in relation to psychosis, but they have broadened out into youth mental health. And mental ill health is the number one threat, you know, in terms of population health to young people's lives in terms of suicide risk and also their futures in terms of their, their functional outcomes. Um, mental ill health, unlike physical health, physical ill health strikes right in this transitional period from puberty through to the, the mid-20s. Um, it's the mirror image of physical illness. People in that age group are physically healthy, but they're they're, they're, the main health problem they face is poor mental health. And then if it doesn't get better, it accumulates and, and persists across the many decades of life. This is, this is supported by the paper that was in JAMA Psychiatry last year by Moffat and Caspi. And what they showed was that 
um, you know, the, the, um, exactly that peak in early, early adult life, uh, adolescence, early adult. And though, if, you, if you actually suffered from poor mental and cognitive health during this period, you were much more likely to develop physical and degenerative illnesses later in life, physical ones. So, so it's like the big thing that we could do in mental health was look after these young people in a very effective way, and that would improve their, their life course in, in many other ways as well. So very powerful argument. That's, this paper was only two pages but very, very important. And this is the effect on development of having mental ill health, I won't go into that. So talking about solutions, um, and this may help us with our diagnostic reform process too. If we modernize the, 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 the culture of healthcare, so that, and, and we provide the care, we integrate health and social care in the, in, in the same venue, um, again, with co-design with, with the people using the services, the young people, we might be able to move from the thing on the left to the thing on the right, which is much more attractive to, to the service users, and they also have a stake in it. And we did this in Australia through a program called Headspace. It started in 2006 with 10 centres, and by the end of next year it will be in 145 centres across the whole country. So it's been very popular amongst the young people, amongst communities, with politicians, um, it's treated a lot, a lot of young people in, in a pretty holistic sort of way, I would say. If you want to read about it, it's been published um, in Lancet Psychiatry, um, in World Psychiatry. And as well as grassroots support from the public, it's had incredible support from politicians. Every, every Prime Minister that we've had for the last 10 years, we change them very often in Australia, <laughs> possibly not often enough, but... but, um, <laughs> but um, they want to be associated with it. These pictures are taken from election campaigns um, and, uh, and they want to be associated with this reform because, you know, it's the first time we've had a positive brand that the politicians want, want to be linked with because, um, yeah, it's something they can do. They, they, it, it's very easy to beat up politicians for not doing the right thing, but if you, if you give them a solution and they support it, then I think it's a very positive dynamic. We, we've tried to review the world experience in this in uh, Medical Journal of Australia a couple of years ago, and it's, it's happening in about 15 different countries, this sort of integrated youth health care idea, which is not a very radical idea. It's pretty obvious, really, if you, if you just talk to the young people and you talk to um, their families as well. So, World Economic Forum. This data appeared about seven or eight years ago. It shows not just is the human cost of, of, of uh, mental ill health appearing at this stage of life enormous, but the economic cost is huge. The biggest threat to GDP from a non-communicable disease source is mental illness. And the reason for that is because of the timing in the life cycle. It's, it's common, but it, it, it strikes early, unlike the cancers and, and cardiac disease. So it has a huge economic impact, which the World Economic Forum has actually acknowledged. This was um, la last year. They, they um, initiated a whole program of, of projects of which one of them was youth mental health, which we were associated with, and that was reported on in Davos this year. And this is the program. So it's, um, we're trying to develop a global model, you know, with some basic principles for youth mental health. And, and by youth mental health, I mean 12 to 25, roughly, puberty to mid-20s. You call it transitional psychiatry, I think, in, in, in Belgium and Netherlands. And so a lot of planning and workshops were held. Many countries have been involved in, in the consultation process, um, lots of low, middle and high income resource settings. This is what these services look like. There's a, there's a brand issue here, uh, like a trusted brand issue. It doesn't say mental health clinic or psychiatric clinic, it says headspace, which is a much more neutral sort of sounding term, which everyone needs headspace. Everyone needs that kind of uh, idea. Denmark, they have um, a headspace model as well. Um, and I heard today Belgium has, has got something very similar. Um, in British Columbia and Canada, they, they call it the foundry, that, that this, this type of model, integrated healthcare for young people. Um, at ease in the Netherlands, I was there la last week, and, um, or this week, and um, very, very positive atmosphere there too. Probably needs to be strengthened and you know, integrated better with the clinical side, but the youth volunteers are very impressive and very positive. Um, Israel has, has two headspaces. In France, they have Maison des Adolescents, which is same age group, but probably different content of the model, um, but still the same idea, community-based integrated youth health care. Uh, and Ireland, Jigsaw, yesterday in Dublin, Prince William, 
um, and Kate, you know, Princess Kate, visited Jigsaw. If you have a look on Twitter, there's lots of pictures of them in this youth mental health service in, 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 in Ireland. In England, they claim to have a few, but I, I think that they're more specialised, aren't they? And uh, in Birmingham, maybe it, it, it's probably not quite the same idea. And, and, and uh, it's more difficult with the British system of general practice, I think, to do this. You know, in the US, obviously, they've got massive problems with their health system in relation to mental health. And, but they do have a couple of services like this in, in Northern California called Alcove, which is the same idea as well. And in South Africa, this is a little bit different. This is more like a, a program, a, a, a youth mental health program based around surfing. And it's, um, it's very compatible with, with these more uh, sort of um, clinical foci um, in, in the integrated youth health care. But this is, this is very dynamic and very positive as well. So our colleagues, um, working on the World Economic Forum project have developed this model of care which can be flexed and adapted according to the service settings and the resource settings but has got some basic principles and one of the key ones is youth engagement, youth participation, service user involvement. Um, and these service users are, are, are much fresher than, than the people who have experienced longer term mental illness. They've got great ideas, they, they are not too alienated from us as professionals and they really help to design a much better system of care that we couldn't do it without them. Some people have criticised this as like a McDonald's approach to mental health, but at least with a McDonald's you know you're going to get a reliable product, even if you don't like it. Um, so other processes, Niles are supporting us with a, a, com a commission on youth mental health, which has been constructed as we speak. There's an international network of, of these uh, services and, and uh, these professionals, but also young people. So this is um, any one of the, if you go to one of these conferences, maybe a third of the audience will be young people and it's co-convened by young people as well. So a very different experience, say, from today where we have, you know, middle-aged people in the room. In, in, in this conference, you know, there would be, the, the mean age would be much lower. And early intervention is another focus. So just to finish, what is the task, you know, and can, could this be done, a, a global collaborative strategy to build I would say diagnostic models rather than model um, that has real utility. Uh, this is the holy grail, I guess. Real utility for clinicians and patients. It's understood and accepted by patients in society because you can see that we have to get better tolerance and acceptance of, 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 of these approaches. Um, it's culturally universal but adaptable and removes barriers to discovery and, and learning more about the nature and the underpinnings of mental Ill health and novel, novel therapies and to implement, implementation of findings. So that's a very tall order, actually. I don't know if, if it can be done, but it's, it's something to aspire to and something we could work on more practically as well. And um, some of the techniques um, and uh, stepping stones to the Holy Grail. So sorry if I went slightly over, uh, but uh, thank you very much for listening. The difference between stepped and staged care, in my mind, is step care is very popular in Australia, because, but that is a demand management strategy by government to, to kind of restrict care, I, I would say, to, it, not to actually favour care. It sounds, it sounds like it's favouring care that you step up if you need it, but they use it to, to control access, actually, and, and the, um, <clears throat> what they require is for you to, to get worse. You know, they want you to get worse before you can go to the next step which is very negative and neglectful, where stage care philosophically wants, wants to give you the best chance of not progressing to the next stage, and with, with a lot of hope that, of, of, of trying to do that as best we can.